Welcome to June's ETM Wednesday webinar hosted by eLife, the series that aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss in issues important to you and your research career. Today our speakers will discuss how to overcome language barriers in science. The webinar will begin with the panelists sharing their stories. Then in the second half, you will be putting your questions to them. To ask your question, you can type in the question box in the GoToWebinar functions panel, or you can tweet us, we are at eLife Community, using the hashtag ECR Wednesday. Finally, I would like to let you know that we are recording the webinar and that it will be made available on YouTube in the near future. Now I'll pass over to Margarita to introduce the panelists. Hello, uh, thank you very much, Elsa, for that introduction. So I'd like to welcome you to our new uh, webinar. Um, as Anna um, said in the title, we are going to talk about how to become language barriers in science. This is because, I mean, um, not being an uh, English uh, native speaker, um, I can realize that English is uh, it's the most important uh, um, language that is um, dominating science. And um, I think it is a bit of a bar barrier or an obstacle for new research, early career researchers that they actually need to be fluent in English in order to be able to, um, to share the science. So I realize it can be a problem when they, they are not fluent in English and we're going to talk about all the, I mean, everything related to language and science. So for this, I would like you to introduce, introduce you our speakers. Um, we're going to hear about uh, Clarissa. It's, uh, she's a scientist. Uh, she's working at the Ministry of Environment in Peru and the European Commission and in the Center for Security Policy. And she gives uh, science-based uh, evidence and advice for policy making. Um, she's the founder and the director of a non-profit which focuses on empowerment of Latin American young professionals uh, with the programs of professional mentorship. Uh, her work also relates to international security, emerging technologies, science diplomacy, gender equality, reduction of inequalities and education for sustainable development goals. We also have a uh, Biswa. Well, actually, the order will be with Biswa first, then will be Carissa. Sorry. Biswa is an assistant professor of Wake Forest University School of Medicine in the US. Uh, he's a volunteer mentor uh, with uh, Offer Aid, and uh, he is an ambassador of uh, our ELIS uh, community. Um, he, uh, yes, very proud of that. He, uh, uh, he uh, works at his uh, biomedical research. It's on the power of high resolution mass spectrometry driven metabolomics alongside with other omics to understand human metabolic disorders and health um, uh, wellness. Um, and as an ELIS ambassador, he tries to improve the QBU process, promote autonomous and preprint, and change academic uh, meritocracy to help look at the metrics. So he hopes it's going to be less away and just will um, stop. <laughs> then we'll have uh, Tatsuya, and uh, he is an ARC Future Fellow at the School of Biological Science at the University of Queensland. Um, he is actually, what time is over there? Uh, it's uh, after 1, 1 a.m. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit sleepy, but yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much for coming to the seminar then. You're welcome. Seminar, so it's even more difficult for you. Uh, and he's primarily interested in how scientists can make meaningful contributions to halting and reversing the ongoing global biodiversity crisis. Um, he is, uh, has a project that tries to understand the consequences of language barriers in biodiversity conservation with the Translate project. Um, hope he was going to talk up a little bit about that. And he aims to assess the importance of scientific knowledge that is available in non-English uh, languages and, the, and understanding how language barriers impede the application of science in decision making and device solution for exchanging information across languages in an effective manner. And mm -hmm. then we have Yad, 
who is a professor and the regional representative of epigenetics in Africa. Um, he is at the research arm of a uh, medicines in medicine in fronteras. I don't know how to say in French or doctors without borders. He is currently based in Cameroon. Um, he has been the head of the epicenter research base in Rwanda, and he has been leading research projects in tuberculosis, malaria, and others. Um, he is in charge of the field coordination um, for the MSF epicenter vaccine against Ebola and various other uh, virus, and during these outbreaks in West Africa and now in Congo. Uh, in all his work, um, Diab has been inspired by the vision of a healthy and wealthy Africa and aims to create a critical mass of young Africans to find homegrown and innovative solutions to address the public health challenges in, in Africa. So that's a bit of a very brief introduction of all our speakers. I mean, I have to apologize at the very beginning because our webinar will be in English and we're going to talk about all the problems of having only English as, um, as a language in science, but I think at the moment at least it is the language that we can use. So many thanks for all the speakers and for anyone who's attending the webinar. We're going to welcome your questions and try to have a very uh, good discussion afterwards. And I give uh, Visla uh, the word so he can uh, start to give class. Visla? You can all see my screen? Yeah. Oh, just... Hi, you can all see my screen? Yes, I think so. Yeah, uh, thank you. So as you can see here, I have highlighted uh, the language barriers in green. That means it shouldn't be affecting our science and I have given a green signal uh, for it to move on uh, in a very positive way. Uh, so as you see this slide, I'm going to tell you that um, there is a very famous saying that you are not doing science if you are not communicating science. So you can do very fantastic science inside your lab, inside your you know computers, but if it doesn't get communicated to the to the society, to the global uh, community of scientific researchers, your peers, colleagues. Uh, policy makers and uh, more wider dissemination then you are doing a disservice to science and to communicate it you need a, a medium and that is language which is English or whatever uh, currently it's English and uh, being from India uh, you learn English very early on that helps a little but not everybody is lucky even in Indian system to learn English uh, there is a mother tongues uh, of 22 different states and you know they are using you know, 20 different languages there are 600 different dialects that complicates the matter a lot and uh, coming from uh, you know from a family where my, where my father who used to have a master's in english you learned more of british english you know use, usage of english in that victorian era then you come to the us to work then you realize it's american english and then you realize uh, in, in scientific communication, you use um, scientific English. It's not American, not British. So, giving you a perspective, uh, I have been approached, as you can see, last 11 hours back, six days, one week, one week, and two weeks back in ResearchGate. And through author AD, uh, through that service, uh, over Gmail, so many requests from different Speaker, uh, from different scientific authors and researchers, mostly early career researchers who are PhD students, graduate students, postdocs, sometimes faculty from different countries and who approach me to edit their article. It all started with me volunteering on research gate and on author AD, author aid, that I, I can volunteer for you in my free time to give a read to your scientific article and edit it for language or for you know uh, scientific policy and stuff like that then the request started piling up and it came like thousands 
and hundreds at some point and i said thank you for approaching me but sorry i can't do it just because as a, as a postdoc and as a faculty you got very little time for yourself you know writing grants and writing your own papers so started with the volunteering service now i have to stop it at some point now then i'm realizing that most of these requests come from you know deeper parts of asia from africa from latin america and you know in european countries where language has been an issue uh, when communicating in english so um, in the next slide uh, i try to highlight some of the challenges and opportunities and some of the questions i would like to open for this uh, audience to discuss and the panelists to discuss so i see some of the challenges is coming from the education system because uh, a lot of this is coming from the mother tongue or the native language uh, of a given country and it's a very late start with english and that's what propagates that there is a fear factor there is a uh, inability or there is a um, reluctance to do things in english because you have been trained for your 10 years in high school and you know another four years in college sometimes masters in non english medium and a uh, lot of these things is also coming from socio cultural background for example coming from india i had never had a course that taught me how to write scientific uh, english or scientific writing nobody taught me what a pla what plagiarism could be the favorite thing cut copy paste you try to cut and copy and paste from everything the ccp is a very bad term but it's very common out there and everybody does it this thing that well nobody writes anything from new so you can take it from others and compile your own and this is very prevalent so there is also issues with the training and education what you receive so there was no course absolutely i mastered i did my masters i did my phd in one of the top institutions in india but there are no courses that helps you to you know write scientific writing or there is awareness on that and then i realized when i had to write my own manuscripts out of my phd thesis uh, during my doctoral studies that doing experiments was so easy and writing uh, those in the form of scientific communication was so hard so it's a very different ball game than just writing in english i mean i i can write very flowery english with you know uh, shakespearean poems and you know poetry writing good stories but when writing scientific uh, manuscripts it's a, lo a lot of challenge so there are ample opportunities i think we'll discuss in details as we move to the panels but so somebody needs to volunteer so a group of like minded people who can you know probably volunteer few hours but how many you can do thousands hundreds you know you know but there are the requirement is so so huge that probably this approach may not work and then once you do this are you being an author because you are not charging it's not a freelancing thing so you are not you know asking for money so there is a there is always a you know trend to for somebody acknowledging you or giving you authorship but if it's not related to your field are you going to do it are you comfortable doing it so why not start a e life community volunteer scientific writing online course that people can take somebody can volunteer we can gather and start something or is there a scope for non english scientific journals you know i recently heard this that uh, from india they are starting a india archive they are trying to have uh, uh, manuscripts uh, in that preprint server india archive to allow submission of scientific Uh, articles in non english languages which are coming from different states there are like 26 or 25 different languages which are officially more or less recognized to allow that and and of course you know there is self writing and reading it you know makes it perfect you know you can start with tweets facebook posts blogs and stuff like that so there are a lot of questions so some of the questions that i'm going to discuss is you know is it difficult to pass on the scientific content of a manuscript to global audience effectively yes because if it's really poorly written then it can give a reviewer a very hard time it could be a fantastic scientist but you know as a reviewer when i'm reading it i'm not very comfortable reading what you are doing and are the non open access or the traditional journals helping edit or polish language for the accepted manuscripts probably not nothing other than they point to different editing services that make a lot of money out of it they charge you for open access but even for open access articles there is a lot of crappy writing out there it has not been polished for languages and stuff like that 
So the third question is, can journals be lenient or solely language-based decisions should not be taken and not point to editing services? Yes, this can be done, but it needs a much bigger initiative. And you know, somebody needs to make sure that this happens, that your science is not solely rejected based on the language quality and stuff. So yeah, I'll stop there and let others speak through. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rippo. That was very enlightening, I think. So now we have to listen from Clarissa. Yes. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, well, I'm Clarissa Rios. I'm from Peru in South America. So Peru is here, Brazil, Chile, Colombia. You more or less can have an idea where I am, where I come from. So I left Peru in 2006. And the first place that I went to study as an exchange student was Finland. And my boss still remembers, my ex-boss still remembers that when I arrived, I was speaking like Tarzan, like, I want mm, that, and things like this. So with that example and another, our biggest enemy is fear. Fear to go out, fear to look, um, silly fear that not to look so intelligent and so on and i think that's one of the first things that we have to get rid of and i'm so glad that um my previous uh, colleague already talked about the scientific part so maybe i can focus a little bit more about um the tips and recommendations that i would suggest for you to open up opportunities for yourself so being honest i have uh, applied to many different scholarships and fellowships, and all of them were in English. I think there were only three that were in Spanish, and all the rest are in English. So I think this is something that you have to know. If your English is not very good, it's something that you have to work on. How can you work on, on that? I, I guess that if you have connection to the internet, you can go to the YouTube. And there are many tutorials. You can chat in English with people from abroad through different sort of platforms and you can download apps that are for free that can help you to improve your English as well. And I think that the best teacher is the need, the need to feel that you need to speak the language because otherwise you will not survive. And that was what happened to me in Finland. It was rather I speak Finnish or I speak English. So it was really, really for me uh, motivating to don't have many Spanish speakers or my family around because that was the, what really put me on, on, on course. You know, you know, you have to learn English ASAP, otherwise you are. And at the beginning, I, I, I like to, to make jokes. So I remember that I wanted to say something and I was translating the joke and then everyone was in another conversation already. So these are the things that you're gonna face, but that doesn't matter. I mean, that's, um, that would pass quickly. And there are sometimes things that, um, for example, one day I was with flu and I went to, the, to my PI, to my principal investigator, and I say, eh, sorry, I couldn't come because I was constipated. And I said constipated because in Spanish, when you have the flu, you say constipado. So in my brain, yeah, so my, my PI looked at me and was like, okay, and these things are gonna happen, you know? So you have to relax, embrace that you, are, you have a second language that you are learning, and you have to forget about all that. It will pass and you will become a, a better speaker with time. I have a friend from Spain that went to Finland and didn't speak any English. After one year, she was super fluent. So if she can do it, if I could do it, you can also do it. Other recommendations that I can also uh, suggest is to do networking, networking in, in English. And you have to practice it by going to different um, open seminars, by going to these type of webinars where you have to listen different accents in English that sometimes they are much easier than the, than the native speakers. I remember that at the very beginning, my Spanish friends told me the only ones that don't speak good English are the people from UK and US because I understand everyone from, you know, from India, from Colombia, from Belgium, but I don't understand people from UK. So, uh, so just try to, you know, watch Netflix and things like that. Other thing that I would suggest you is to try to jump into a mentoring program. And as it was previously mentioned, Author 8 is one of them. Uh, because I had all these struggles with the language is that I founded the organization Papalek that is for Latin American students. And what we do is to do mentoring in the language they speak. 
So now we have Spanish, we have some videos in Portuguese, and some articles and videos on Quechua, which is the, um, uh, the second important language in Peru, and it's from the Inca Empire. So I also wrote an article in Nature talking about this, why is it important that we do this type of guidance to students in, the, in a language that they can speak. And some of the uh, critics or, or the things, the comments I saw on Twitter were like, well, but English is much easier, and I have learned English at the school, so why, why are you saying that we have to do it in another language? So just to open up your minds in this sense, I would like to say that even if you receive English at your school, this is not the case for large part of the population in the world. In Latin America, if you have no money, you will probably not have access to have uh, uh, English courses. In my case, I was privileged that even though my parents didn't not have enough money, they will cut the holidays. We never want holidays, that's what, for example. And they will put me into English classes. So, and even these English classes make me go to Finland speaking like Tarzan, but still it was, it was good enough. Um, the other recommendation that I would like to, to tell you is that you have to use social media in a way that is not just for um, catching up with friends and connecting with your favorite celebrity. I think that there are much better ways that you can use social media. You can follow uh, different um, websites that are talking not just about English, but about a topic that you're interested in. For example, I follow UNESCO, UNITAR, the WHO, and I always receive constantly in my feed. I can see all the posts in English. And of course, you also have the one in your own language, but this is a way for you to start looking at English every day and every moment that you open your social media. Uh, also, another thing as a, uh, that I would like to suggest you to do is like you have to become, you can become a science communicator. And that's something that is uh, in the real need in this moment because most of science communication is happening in English, but not in your, in other languages. So for example, like at Ekpapalek, we have a blog in Spanish, we have a YouTube channel in Spanish, and this is our way to, to keep promoting, you know, that in our own language and to not have access to English, to still know about what's happening uh, in science around the world, what are things that you could be looking in the future if you want to look for a postdoc or for a PhD or a master. For example, in 2006, microarrays was a boom in technology. Nowadays, it's, it's, it's not anymore, and or, or it has been replaced by other technologies that are a little bit um, better. So if someone is thinking of like right, microarrays, I mean, this is so much in the past, and these are things that you can do for your own community to, to try to give back. If you don't have much time, then if English comes easy to you and you want to reach a broader audience, you can also use, for example, Instagram. In my case, I have opened uh, last year an account that is called Being a Scientist is Cool, with the aim to show that um, scientists are not always at the lab and are not always uh, with the glasses and these stereotypes that are really good in one sense, but on the other sense, you know, it's people have the idea that we are some people that live in the caves and never see the light. So I try to, to show some pictures and for example, talk about this webinar and events that I go and things that are up to date in English in, in, in this case, because I feel that already I'm doing it in Spanish in the other, in the other platform. But anyway, it's another, it's another recommendation that I could give you. Whatever fits you, whatever suits you, is something that you should definitely at least try and see if it's something for you. If it's not, you close your account and that's it. Uh, some recommendations that I also have for PIs, for principal investigators, is uh, it's very important that you have a big variety in your group. So, I mean, I cannot talk about myself, but I can talk about awesome people coming from different parts of the world that have really enriched the labs and the working groups where we have been, rather because they have other type of ideas, rather because they see a topic for a different angle, and then when we are brainstorming, bam, a, a really nice technique or a really nice idea comes to the comes to the table, and also because culturally it's, it's really enriching and really um, really beautiful to be with people from all over the world. So my recommendation for PIs or everyone that is in a position of power, let's say, is to uh, embrace diversity, embrace intergenerational communication, and I think that uh, we can reach more in terms of science in that sense. Uh, what else I would like to talk about? Um, maybe I can tell you more stories if you are interested on, on that and, and how I, I try to overcome 
my difficulties with the language, as you can see, I still have a very strong accent in Spanish. And I remember I was doing my three minutes thesis and some French PI came to me and said like, okay, it was nice, but can you do it in, in English now? Because my accent was so strong. Of course, I laughed because you have to take these things like uh, lightly and I just prepared better. And I actually won the three minutes thesis on my, on my, on my institute. So don't feel discouraged by these things. Sometimes people say it as a joke, sometimes they don't, but you cannot control what people say to you. You can only control how you react to those things. Uh, and I think that uh, I will stop here and maybe uh, we can have more room for questions. Thank you, Margarita. Thank you very much, Clarissa. That was uh, very nice. Um, now uh, we'll have Tatsuya to talk about his experience and his experience. Okay. Uh, can I show my slide? Can you see my slide? Okay, can you see my slide? So I can't hear you, but is it okay? Yes, yes, can you see my slide? Okay, yeah, great. Okay. Sorry, I so, need my echoes, <laughs> but yeah, it very well. Okay, great, yeah. So I have been working on this variation of language barriers in science, and particularly in environmental sciences, which is my own discipline. And obviously, as we have been discussing today, this is a very important issue for the development of career for non-native English speakers. But I'm actually focusing on this uh, issue of language barriers from a slightly different direction which is a barrier to the application and the compilation of scientific knowledge at the international level. So as we all know, English is now playing a key role as a lingua franca in science. But actually, it is also true that many scientists and users of scientific knowledge still quite often communicate scientific findings in languages other than English. And if this is the case, there's a huge barrier between these different communities communicating in different languages. And in this case, languages can represent a huge barrier to the compilation of non-English scientific knowledge at the international level. For example, in 2016, we, we published this paper in Prose Biology where we found we we investigated the number of scientific documents published in 2014, searched with these two keywords, biodiversity and conservation, in 16 different languages. And what we found was that about 64% of the scientific documents was published in English, which is not that surprising. But the remaining 36% of the scientific documents was actually in languages other than English, particularly Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Chinese, French, etc. So this simply means that by ignoring non-English scientific knowledge, we might lose up to 36% of the scientific knowledge available around the world. So this, this can be a huge loss to the scientific community. And on the other hand, English I mean, languages can represent a huge barrier when trying to apply English-based knowledge to local issues such as policy making or, or, or conservation practices. For example, in, in the same paper, we did a quick survey with directors of protected areas in Spain, and we found out that over half the directors rec actually recognized language barriers to the use of scientific papers for their management of uh, protected areas. So, so this clearly indicates that languages can represent a huge barrier to the application of English-based knowledge, because now scientific knowledge is more and more published in uh, English language only. So the question is how we can solve this problem, and that is what I have been uh, exploring in my uh, current project. And First of all, I think uh, most importantly, it, uh, we should not assume all important information is available and communicable in English. So this is such an important point, but we still tend to assume important information is available only in English and communicable in English. So we should change this assumption definitely. 
And having this in mind, secondary, for example, we can in, always try to involve speakers of multiple major languages in research synthesis, such as when conducting systematic reviews or trying to develop global databases. This is a very simple, straightforward potential solution to this problem, yet really adopted in the scientific community. For example, in my current project called the Translate Project, we have been trying to develop global collaboration to dig up important conservation literature published in languages other than English. And to date, we have already developed collaboration with a wide range of uh, native speakers of these languages in different countries around the world. And we already identified over 600 very uh, important papers that are providing important information for the conservation of uh, species around the world. And these papers indeed provide very important, important information about uh, very local, but often threatened and endemic species. So this simple example clearly indicates that by making a better use of non-English non -English language scientific knowledge, we can improve our understanding of the natural environment on this planet. And thirdly, we can always try to make a more concerted effort to disseminate findings in relevant languages. As, a, as an example, in this paper, we, we, we recently published in Nature, where we found that the loss of wetland biodiversity has been very severe in Western Asian countries, including Iran. So we decided to provide uh, multiple language versions of abstracts of this paper, including this example of Persian uh, version. So this is very simple uh, attempt, but actually uh, recently more and more journals, scientific journals have started to encourage and uh, allow authors to provide multiple language versions of abstract and even main text as well. So this is a, a one potential solution, one fast step toward solving this problem. So these are just uh, some simple examples uh, that I have been thinking about. And I'm happy to uh, discuss these ideas, potential solutions in an uh, opportunity like this webinar. And lastly, most importantly, uh, I think uh, we should definitely change our view toward being a non-native English speaker. So being a non-native English speaker has quite often been recognized as a career disadvantage. And this is certainly true. So we have to somehow overcome the, our own language barrier to develop our, our research career. But at the same time, as I have been explain, explain, explaining in this presentation, being a non-native English speaker actually means that we, you actually have a special important skill for overcoming language barriers in the entire scientific community. So this is a very important point. For example, you can contribute to the global research synthesis activities by increasing the visibility of non-English scientific knowledge, or you can disseminate very important research findings in your own language to those people who are not native English speakers. So being a non-native English speaker also has a very positive side. And this change in our view toward being a non-native English speaker should be able to increase the contribution of non-native English speakers to the scientific community, I believe. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank you very so, much. Great, yeah. Ah? Yes, it was a very nice, uh, it, quite impressive data, but one third of the, that, that's a big number, so yeah, very nice to uh, talk, thank you very much. So now we have Yap, yeah, um, uh, um, where are you now, Bayser, Yap, yeah, sorry? 
Thank you, Margarita. Right now, I'm in Yaoundé. Yaoundé is in Cameroon. Yaoundé is the, the capital city in Cameroon, really just in the middle, in the center of Africa. Oh, so, okay. thank you. I'm really happy, really. Uh, you can't imagine how happy I am to be part of this uh, webinar, to, to, to share part of our challenge. And uh, our challenge, definitely, it's not a fight against English. It's really the challenge of exclusion because of the multilingualism that is not um, there. I will first start by asking Tatsuya, because I saw in, in the slide that you were looking at different parts of the world, but I haven't seen anything happening in Africa. So I will be happy to, to help you in any way possible so that you find those articles that might be relevant. Some might be in French, other in uh, Arabic, other in uh, Portuguese, actually, because you have all those language in Africa. And definitely, this, those are also the country where we have some of those rare disease, neglected, and even some of those outbreaks. So it might be interesting to figure out what we are actually missing as part of those 30 percent that you mentioned. So my challenge is, is really the, you know, the WHO motto, it's no one left behind. But then when you consider language as a barrier, it's actually excluding all the people who can speak English. Though we have to acknowledge that WHO is trying to have different language in all the document, but still in global health, if you don't speak English, you are in trouble. And then we were happy to to push, uh, there was a conference in Kigali, in, uh, in Rwanda, recently organized by the AMREF. It's a uh, big African uh, NGO working together with uh, Netherlands. And it was Africa Health Agenda Initiative Conference, but it was mainly in English. So together with some, with some friends from Anne, Anne Roca from Lancet and uh, Isabel from WHO, we push so that we can have a session in French. And that was the first time that that kind of international English conference was having a small session in French. And it was great because you were having all those uh, researchers who, who came and attend that small session and share the challenge that they were facing. And I remember this guy, I think he was, he was from, from Guinea, and he was saying that uh, when he was trying to make his presentation in French, it, it felt it as if no one was paying attention to him. At the end of the presentation, he has no question. And at some point, he was kind of frustrated. And then you, 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 you move to a point where we all agree that there is a pleasure in giving and receiving. So that guy has been working all a year or two years to have his result. Now he reached a time where we want to share, but then no one is taking what he's sharing. And it's so frustrating. And that's one part of the problem. The other part is, you might not know, but Cameroon is one of the biggest countries producing cocoa. Cocoa that is made, used to make chocolate. And then what we realize is that the people who are actually producing cocoa have never tested chocolate because it's, it's bought from Cameroon and sent to Europe, made, and so on. And this is the same thing for research. You have researchers in Cameroon, in Niger, and many other countries that are going to produce some data in their language. And then those data will be analyzed, interpreted, published in the New England, in the Lancet, in the language that they are not able to read. So this is now inaccessible for them. And I think that is really unfair. So as some of the, the solution, I think quite a number of solutions are already mentioned by Clarissa, Biswa, and uh, Tatsuya. But I think this kind of webinar, going to advocacy, we need to make more and more noise about the need to have every people to be able to communicate on in its own language, starting from the researcher. We agree, English is the lingua franca. So, that, that's, a, that's a fact as per now. But still, we have to work together as uh, Tatsui was showing his article in Nature and then what we do, did in the Lancet so that they publish in English, that's fine, but always in the language of the country where the research has taken place. 
So that's the only way for me that the people who have done the research will have access to the information. That's the only way the Minister of Health will be able to read and say, okay, I'm going to change my guideline, my policy based on this article. If I can't read, I cannot benefit from it. And then we should have in mind that we cannot solve a complex or a wicked problem using only technical solution. We need to have solutions that are more adaptive, which means at some point we need to in involve government because there is the need of a political will. At some point, the, pre the, the Minister of Health of Niger, for example, taking Niger as an example, that's a Francophone country, should say there is no way a research can be done in my country if the results are not published in French, because that's the language we know. It's the same thing for, for other countries. So bringing all those different solutions together, that's the way I think we will be able to limit, to reduce the exclusion that some of us are facing. And I'm, I'm happy to take any question. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, thank you all of our colleagues. So now we are open for questions. Okay, let me send them to me. And then uh, I, I can hear. Ah, there are lots of questions, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, not a question, but a comment. Um, from Mila, saying, unfortunately, there is an invisible barrier, prejudice against people with Latin surnames. We have been a rejected work without even being read. How to face the barriers of linguistic prejudice? Brazil, in English, is a minority. Science in general needs to be accessible to all. So I think I completely agree. I mean, I don't know what you think, but uh, we have the same problem in Chile, so just a small minority that the more wealthy will get to learn English. And if you don't know how to communicate in English, you cannot do real science. Um, and there is a big against, um, against surnames and not in English, I would say, more than just in Spanish, but um, different languages. So if I go to the next question. <laughs> in a globalized okay. in a globalized world where you can access a lot of information and you can opt for self-learning, which you think will be the role of the mentor? This is for Clarissa. <coughs> so Clarissa, what will be the role of a mentor in a world where you can actually get lots of um, learning from you? Sorry, I didn't catch up the question. What's the role of the mentor in the world that? <laughs> Don't worry. In the meantime, maybe I can answer the other question that was about uh, discrimination on surnames in with Latin, Latin surnames, I think they, they mentioned. So I have a friend in the Netherlands that she is using the surname of her um, partner in order to get interviews in the Netherlands. And what I told her is that uh, when I look for jobs in the Netherlands, I'm going to put my surname because if that person discriminates against my background, then I don't want to work in that laboratory or in that institution. So just keep applying to uh, any other institutions and remember that uh, for any type of opportunity, PhD, master program, etc., you have to do a lot of, of applications. I have a friend that told me, Clarissa, it's five years that I don't get a PhD. And I said, like, oh my God, how many times do you apply? And she said, like, I make five, five applications. And I'm like, at least a year, 20, like minimum, uh, even more. I, I cannot conceive that 20 should be enough. So please just keep applying as many, um, as many applications that you can do. And if they are the gonna discriminate for your surname, just go in another place. Margarita, what was the question? Maybe you are better now? <laughs> yes? I think your mute is on. 
Oh, I, I cannot hear you here. <coughs> we're in the middle of the winter, so we've got all these <laughs> last <coughs> things. So <coughs> I put the question in the chat if you want to read it. <coughs> would, you like, would you prefer to read it in the chat? Ah, in this globalized world where you can access a lot of information and you can opt for self-learning, which you think will be the role of the mentor? Uh, there are many things that you cannot learn online. For example, uh, in the mentoring program that we have, it's not that the mentees only contact the person because they are studying economy and the mentor is an economist. They, are, they uh, contact the mentor because they want to know how did they get there. And I think these stories, these, uh, uh, you only know about the achievements of your friends, right? You know, like, oh, this person got this job, or this person now is a CEO, or this person is whatever. But they don't know that in the background, you know, there are so many rejections, there are so many hard times, there are so many things that you have to, um, you don't do in order to achieve your dreams. So what we do in the mentoring, the mentor has to be open. The mentor has to tell the truth has to guide the person and, and, and how the different pathways that they can take, what is the one that fits better to this person. So maybe in this, uh, as you say, where there is uh, open access to a lot of information, maybe there should be more blogs to talk about what are the real struggles, how did they come up, uh, how they overcome the struggles, and then maybe you can learn from there. If you go to the Ekpapalek blog, you have a lot of these stories, how many people have made it in science and non-scientific careers. And by clicking right, you can translate it to English. So this uh, this is accessed by anyone. Really sorry for my voice. <laughs> it's definitely good. But thank you, Kerisha, for that. I think there is a question for Tatsuya that I just posted on the chat. <coughs> so you can read it loud if you want. <coughs> can you? Get that chat. It's. Would you like to read it loud? Or... <coughs> it's about the international seminars or congress. It says, could it remind be. Me to, remind me it was on. So, can I read it? Yes, please. I have some question about the international seminars or congress. Could it be possible that non native speakers are participating? less in this type of events what can we do about it other question that i have just for discussions it is known that language changes language changes our way of thinking could it be possible that conserving multi languages in changes offers diversity to the scientific questions that could be asked and the last question, I did a research about the consequences of publishing in English for Colombian graduate students, but I have not found a journal that wants to publish the research in two languages, uh, Spanish and English. Do you know experiences or journal of publishing in two or more languages the same paper? Okay, so there are three questions. The first one is the uh, participation in seminars of Congress. And could it be possible that non native speakers are participating less in this type of events? Uh, I'm not sure. So, obviously, non native speakers tend to, I'm not sure. I think there are obviously many non native speakers at the International Congress. But probably the main biggest problem is the presentation itself, because many people find it difficult and uh, challenging to, to speak in English, particularly frequently, uh, very fluently. So there is a huge barrier in that sense. But I'm not sure if there are less participants from the non-native English speakers, maybe other people can answer this question. Maybe Tatsuya, if I if I may add something uh, to contribute on on that, uh, you know, my perspective is that conference it's also a market which depend on the of the, the demand and the supply. What we've realized is that uh, the conference I mentioned in Rwanda is that quite a number of, of French speakers 
apply for the conference in French. They mm -hmm. send their abstract in French. And at some point, the organizer realized that actually those people are quite a number. Therefore, we can allow them to have their own session in the language. So I, I, I believe that if at some point there is a, a more and more demand of people speaking French, Portuguese, or Spanish, and whichever language, applying for uh, so those conferences in their native language, at some point, they will feel that, OK, we have a, a, a sufficient number to allow to have those kind of sessions. And maybe also to take the service of interpret, because that's also a possibility. If the number is big, then they will say, OK, we have a big number of Chinese who are coming for the conference. Let's make sure that we have the translation program during the conference. So that's why I, I will encourage more and more people to apply to those conferences and the language, and then it will appear more and more that, that it's a challenge. Yeah, I think that, that's a really good point. And uh, in a slightly related uh, point, I think uh, it is quite important to organize such an international conference in uh, uh, non-native English speaking countries. But now, many international conferences quite often uh, organized in English speaking countries. But if you, you can organize such conferences in non-native English speaking countries, you can have more you know, relaxing mood, relaxing atmosphere in that conference. And that might encourage uh, non-native English speakers to speak more, uh, uh, more in such a conference. Okay, shall we go to the next question? Uh, could it be possible that conserving multi languages in changes offers diversity to the science, diversity to the scientific questions that could be asked? So this is very important point, and I I would say yes. So I think the diversity of languages or, or diversity of uh, uh, cultural background can definitely add something to the scientific community. Uh, I think the diversity of languages can be linked to the diversity of opinions or approaches, ideas. So in that sense, the uh, conserving or keeping the diversity of languages in the scientific community is a very important and promising approach to, to have a diverse uh, solutions to the uh, global challenges. And uh, I'm really keen to know what others think about this. Uh, yeah, Bishwa here. Um, I, I I completely agree with you. I mean, uh, there could be you know not only uh, uh, addition of uh, thoughts, but you know new research topics and new traditional knowledge can come into context. And people can add in their traditional, uh, say, traditional uh, medicinal plants and all those research. I'm, I'm, I'm doing that kind of research, you know, in phytochemistry and, you know, plant biology and all that. So given somebody's um, country of origin or geographical landscape, uh, they might come with a different uh, uh, research approaches or their traditional knowledge and traditional values. And those can really help enhance. So it depends on the research question. If you are doing a you know more computational research, probably not because it's still computer languages and you know more advanced studies. But then when it comes to more of uh, field research, you know on um, biodiversity or you know uh, medicinal plants or you know therapeutics and all that, of course a lot of diversity will help in that. You know, beyond all this, I think in a lab environment to make it more um, uh, inclusive and, and diverse, I think uh, no matter uh, whether it contributes to scientific knowledge or not, it, it will definitely contribute to the healthy growth and, you know, mutual understanding of each other's sociocultural and other backgrounds. And that helps um, making stronger ties and bonds between different cultures countries, cultures, and nations, and all that. So it's a, it's a plus plus and win win for everybody. So I don't see a downside to it at all. So thank you. I think there are even some studies, actually quite a few studies, that linked the, the diversity of 
ethnicity and cultural background and scientific productivity. So I think this is quite an important point and definitely true. And the final point is uh, if there are any journals that publish uh, papers in two languages, and I think there are actually uh, many journals, uh, particularly in Latin America, I guess. So many journals, as far as I know, many journals, some, at least some journals in Latin America publish uh, papers in Spanish and English as well. And in other languages, I haven't come across any journals doing this, but uh, at least for Spanish, I think there are those opportunities, those journals. And actually the, the Lancet uh, started uh, from the Lancet Global Health to give the opportunity to people to publish in English, of course, and then in the supplementary to have the opportunity to make the translation. It's a process that is ongoing, and the more and more the demand will be there, the more different journal will have to do that. And uh, there's also another journal on, uh, on tuberculosis and lung disease. And usually they will make sure that you have abstract in three to four languages, and then to have the same article published in the language of the country. So I think it's something that is starting, that has started, and we need to, to push more and more so that it, it become um, everywhere. I would expect, uh, obviously, eLife would lead this initiative, this movement, hopefully. Yeah. I think um, just to wrap up a bit of, um, of what we have been talking, um, I would say, um, please uh, stop me if you don't agree with something, but I think the problems are that um, first, that many non-native uh, English speakers, uh, they, don't have, they don't get education or they don't get the training to speak in English. And even worse, as uh, Wiska said, uh, to, uh, we are not trained to have uh, English uh, scientific writing. So that's, uh, that's, that those are two problems that were highlighted. And also that, I mean, um, if uh, all, all publications are in English, they will not go to the places that they should go. So policymakers, they need them to have in their own language to get to, to see the data. And some of the solutions that have been given here is first, well, to try to learn English, which is very hard to all of us, but uh, there are lots of uh, online courses and uh, good uh, scientific writing courses. So maybe we could uh, encourage eLife to give some sort of training or we could help them to create an online um, course for uh, scientific writing. Um, then I thought uh, a very good idea that there are lots of comments about it is to make the effort to publish uh, your reports, your, your whatever, in your publications with your abstract, not only in English, but in other languages. And as Jeff said and you pointed out, there are some journals doing it, so maybe you can put a, a bit more pressure on that. Um, and then uh, I thought it was a great idea to try when you're writing reviews to try to involve um, people from non uh, non English uh, natives uh, to have and um, to have lots of many different languages to have many different point of view when you're writing a review and a summary of the literature. So then you get all these different, even if it's written in English, you get all the different uh, point of views. Um, and then well. Uh, make a lot of noise about this problem. So to talk about that and to, <laughs> I think that was part of the solutions given. Um, and then also to put attention to non-English scientific journals. Something else missing? No, that's perfect. <laughs> it was a quick brief up, I think. So, I mean, we don't have time, we have lots of questions, but I guess we won't have time for for going through them. So i will just say many thanks for, for coming and for joining us in this uh, webinar. And I guess we can continue the discussion, discussion online or through emails or through uh, uh, social media. Thank you very much. Maybe, maybe Margarita, just because before we close, some of those questions, you can send it to us and then we can, we can respond on the website so that people can have access to it later on.
Perfect. Yeah, I'll ask Cora to or oh, uh, uh, Elsa to do it for us, so we can all get the questions. Because I didn't you. go through it. Many thanks, Thank everyone. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>